Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning. And um we're Pam and I are very happy to be back here in in um in uh, PhD, Patras House of Toronto. And first of all, I just want to apologize. You know, I can hear my voice. You know, when we came here last Friday, I had no voice at all. It's very difficult for me to speak. God has blessed me and he has given me a little bit of voice today so that I can, you know, I can um, speak and um, I can speak about God's word, God, God's goodness in our lives. And, but my prayer is that as I speak, may you not hear my ugly voice, but if you, that all of us in our hearts will hear God's word today. Is that okay? Okay, so um, our topic for today is about hardening of hearts and this is my title this is this is the title of the message for today it's the title is do not harden your heart live in faith and the main verse where i will be picking out this message is from the book of hebrews third uh, chapter 3 verse 7 to 19. okay let me just turn on this clicker and is it working? It is working. So before I start the message, I'd like to encourage everyone. Can I ask everyone to stand up? And perhaps we can all read this together as we honor God's word. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to 19. Let's uh, read all together. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be burdened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And as it, it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For, those, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Thank you. So let's uh, let's let's uh, pray. Lord, we just want to thank you, Lord, for gathering all of us today, and we thank you, Lord, for your word. Our prayer, Lord, is that you you be the one to speak in our hearts, in our minds. Lord, I pray that you open our minds, that you open our hearts, so that everything will be clear, Lord, and that you'll be able to find specific application in our lives. Um, Lord, I pray that if there's anything that hinders us from, from truly hearing your word, I pray, Lord, that you help us just put it aside so that our focus will be on to you today. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all be seated. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, so, so like what I said, um, our verse today will be coming from the book of Hebrews. And, you know, the book of Hebrews, let me just give an introduction of what this book is. Okay, so, so this letter was addressed primarily to, to Jewish converts. So those people um, who were formerly Jew and who were familiar with the Old Testament. That's why they were called Hebrews. So these people are believed to be in a, in a very difficult and challenging situation. So this is where this, you know, this whole book of Hebrews are addressed to. So they're in a very challenging situation because although they have surrendered their lives to the Lord, there's this group of people called the Judaizers. And what this Judaizer said, it's okay for you to, you know, to, con to uh, surrender your life to this Jesus. You know, it's okay if you change your language or you start to speak Christianese. You know, that's what they said. But you know what? The Judaizer said, it's okay, but you still need to do all these laws. 
You still need to do circumcision. You still need to, you know, eat the proper food that we're supposed to eat as Jews. And so these are the people who were um, um, experiencing persecution at that time, right? So they, they were forced to do animal sacrifice and circumcision and even refraining from eating certain type of food. So, in the, so the theme of the whole book of, Hebrew, of Hebrews is to, the theme is that Christ is the absolute supreme, supreme and Christ is sufficient, right? Nothing else. Walang dagdag, walang bawas. He is enough. And, you know, Christ, in this book, Christ is shown to be superior to the ancient prophets. You see, the Old Testament people, they have a high reverence to certain, you know, prophets, even to angels and to Moses, of course. Moses was the one who led them out of Egypt. So they revere these people. And what the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is higher than all of them. It's more supreme. And, you know, in fact, the book of Hebrews are called the book of better things. That's what they said. Because the word better in Greek is used almost 15 times in this letter. Okay? And also, just to end about this introduction, one of the good features of the book of Hebrews is that in the book of Hebrews, there's five warnings. Five warnings. So the author of the book has given five important warnings to the Hebrew people. And one of them is warning against disobedience. And this is our topic for today. Right? You know what? When I was young, my father would always gather us. So once in a while, my father would gather us, get a mic. Like something like this, and we would come up with like a program. So, you know, there's three of us in the family, and one of us will go like in front, so that's her stage, and we will do some talent, any kind of talent. You know, sometimes we would recite a poem or dance or sing. And when it's always my turn, so my dad would always, my father will always introduce us. Okay, and then my father would always say, okay, and the next, um, the next number, I'd like to call on Mr. Angelo, so he would say my name, Mr. Angelo, and then there's an alias. Uh, let me call on Mr. Angelo, pinakatigas na ulo sumayaw. So that's how he would introduce me. Because at that time, ako yung pinakamatigas na ulo. You know, I had two sisters, and they're so nice, and they're so obedient. But I'm different. No? Ako yung may pinakamatigas na ulo. And I hope, you know, when I came to know Christ, kahit papano sana na... na Nagbago naman kahit papano, right? Okay, so let's start with the first verse. It says here, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion and the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. So, you know, this is actually captured if you, book, if you read the book of Numbers. It's chapter 13 to 14. This is actually the story of the Hebrew people, of the Israelites. And as we read the Hebrews, there are three groups of people that are involved in the scripture. First, of course, the Hebrews. So they are the, you know, so th this is where the letter of Hebrews are written to. So the Hebrews. The second are the early Israelites. Because the author got this story from the Old Testament and used it as an example to bring God's message to the Hebrews. And of course, the third group of people is who? Us, right? Because this is also applicable to all of us. And this book speaks to us as well. And the story is here, right? So what happened is that as early as in Exodus, God had already called Moses and God had wonderful plans for the, Isra for the Israelites, for God's chosen people. And it, in, in fact, it says here in Exodus 3, 8, this is God speaking. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out to that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites. Right? So, so we all know the story. So Moses led them out of Egypt. They've seen so much miracles. And when it's about to enter the promised land, malapit na malapit na sila, what they did is that Moses sent a group of people, some spies, right? And these spies are supposed to go to the land that, they, that God had promised to them to check it out. How is everything, right? Can you check 
what types of people are there? Are they strong or weak? How many are they? And then Moses told them, okay, check the land also. Check them if they're good or bad. Check the town. Do they, is it a wall? You know, are they, do they have walls? Check the soil. Is it fertile or, or not? And can you also check whether there are trees or not? So this is supposed to be the mission of all the spies. So we all know the story. The spies went there. After a few days, they came back. They came back. They even have a pasalubong. They have, you know, fruits. And it's, the fruits are so plenty and so big that they have to help each other to carry that. And then they reported back. They said, okay, Moses, we've seen it. And it's true. It's the land flowing with milk and honey. Wow, okay. Good, good, good. And then, but you know what? There's a problem. The problem is, there are other people. Mukhang may nakatira na, right? So it's very difficult to push them out. And they said, we're, we're almost like grass, grasshoppers compared to them. You know, they, they're descendants of Anak, Hittites, Jebusites. They're giants. And they seem to be very surprised. But if you look at it, in fact, even as early as in Exodus, they've already been warned. They said, I will bring you to this land. There are other people who are already there, but that's the land I've given to you. But they seem to be very surprised. And then one of the spies said, Caleb said, you know what? We should go up because, you know, God has already removed their protection. And God will, cost, will use us and will enable us to defeat all of them. Right? So Caleb said, are you, are you all with me? He didn't hear any support. Sabi no mga ibang spies, no, I don't think so. I don't think that will happen. We're like grasshoppers. We don't want to go there. And you know what? All the people start to, to grumble. Sabi na, eto na naman tayo. Sana, we should have just stayed there in Egypt. You know, at least there we're safe. We have, we don't have enemies. Of course, life is hard. But at least we're not gonna, we're not all gonna die. He said, oh, nako, mas maganda pa sana bumalik na lang tayo doon. So, this is what we do. So, all of them spoke to each other. Let's all elect new leaders. We don't want the leadership now. We don't like this Moses. Moses wants to go there. Let's elect a leader to bring us back to Egypt. So, that's what they all said. You know what God's response is? You know what God's response? He said, okay, so, so God responds. They said, God spoke to them. He said, how long? How long will they treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe me in spite of all the signs, in spite of all the miracles that they've seen? And, you know, right then and there, God wants to strike all of them out. God just wants to kill all of them, the entire generation. Eventually, Moses, you know, pleaded to God and, 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 and Moses said, please don't strike all of them. Eventually, God has decided that because of their disobedience, not one of them, not a single person in that whole generation will be able to enter the promised land, except to those couple of people who believed. So that's, you know, that's, that's the story at that time. And if you take a look at it, they, these people, the whole generation, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. You see, in the story of the Old Testament or in the Bible, there were only three periods where miracles happened day in and day out. No, there are only three periods. Right now, we don't see, you know, miracles. But in the Bible, there were three periods where, you know, miracles just happen, just like a regular occurrence. And that is one of them when they were in the wilderness for 40 years. And they've seen everything. They've seen 10 plagues. They've seen the Red Sea. They've seen an angel of God in the pillar of cloud. And they've seen, when they're hungry, what will happen? Food will come out from the heaven in the form of manna. When they're so sick and tired of manna, they requested for meat. So this time, what happened? God gave them lechon manok. No, they gave them quail. It comes down from heaven. And even the water, no, it's purified water. It comes out from rocks. No? So, you know, just, you know... And I, when I was just looking at this, I see, you know, tayo talaga, we always have the tendency to be amazed with miracles. No? I remember when I was young, we were, you know, my family were driving somewhere north, 
and then we passed by a place because they said, you know, th there was this tree that was supposed to be miraculous because it's shaped like a person who's praying. So my parents said, okay, like, put it on. And we started praying there. Of course, that was last time when I didn't know the Bible yet. But, you know, you know in the Philippines, we have lots of those miracles. And we have a tendency to be, you know, gravitated towards that. And, and truly, one of the purposes of God, why he made all those miracles is... You know, really to, you know, to let Israelites witness God's power and authority so that they will believe. So that they will believe. But the question is, did they believe? After seeing all those for, imagine 40 years, they've seen all the miracles. Did they believe? The answer is no. In fact, not only did they believe, but they also put God to test so many times. You know, you don't put someone, someone you love to a test, right? Um, and why did they not believe? It was because their hearts were hardened. Their hearts were hardened. What is a hardened heart? Let's try to understand. When you say hardened heart, what does it mean? But I think it's also important what Let's, let's look at what the heart is in the first place. So the Bible considers the heart to be the hub of the human personality, producing the things we would ordinarily ascribe to the mind. So there are certain things that we think is coming from the mind, but it's actually coming from the heart. There are several verses which says or explains to us what the heart is for. You know, when we grieve, it says in John chapter 4, verse 1, let, us, you, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So that's, there's the word heart there. How about our desires? It says in Matthew, but I tell you that anyone who looks at the woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In his heart. Joy. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, let Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. This is just what we did. You know, when we were worshiping the Lord, we didn't really use our voice to worship the Lord. We worship Him with our heart. That's the main instrument for worship. And there's also understanding and thoughts and reasoning and even faith and belief. It says in, in Hebrews, Romans, and Mark, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So again, that's, there's the notion of the heart. So we all understand that heart is very important. Now, let's look at what it means when there's a hardened heart. You know, there's a... There's really a, you know, a medical condition where the heart is actually hardened. That means, in the, you know, I, I, I was just reading it yesterday. In the human anatomy, the heart is one of the most important organs in our body. Of course, it is important because it pumps out blood from different parts of our you know, body, and it brings oxygen. But according to this heart researcher in, USL, in UCLA, it says, the cardiovascular system is one of the soft tissue that gets calcified very easily. That means there's calcium deposits and it becomes really hard. It's like hard as stone. So he is referring to heart condition where the heart literally becomes hard because of the accumulation of calcium salts in the tissues of the heart. And you know what that happens when it gets calcified, when it gets literally hard? You know, the blood vessels eventually you know, calcification in blood vessels can eventually block them up. And in the heart, it actually blocks electrical signals that keep the cardiac muscles beating. That means the heart, once they are calcified, they just suddenly stop beating. And that's where everything ends. You know, there's literally a medical condition where the heart is actually hard, as hard as stone. But if can that happen to our physical heart, do you know what can also happen to us spiritually when you have a hardened heart? Let's look at here. You know, in this verse, I'll be quoting a passage on Mark chapter 8, verse 17 to 19. And in here, let's read. So aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember 
when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you did you um, pick up? So the context here is that all these apostles they just came back from a miracle which was done by God. They just fed five thousand, and they've just seen in their own eyes how God has multiplied this food, this bread and loaves and, and loaves and fish. But right after that, they were asking each other. Sa tayo ko ng pagkain. They were asking each other, right? And, you know, and so that's the context there. And the hardened heart is actually a condition where it's a spiritual heart condition as an abil- inability to see, understand, hear, and remember. That's what happens. We have a hardened heart. Nagkakaroon tayo ng amnesia. You know, one of the things that we praise God are the miracles that God's in God's goodness in our lives. Um, you know, in, in like for example, in our life, um, I can attest that, you know, um, God has been so good to us. So my, my family, I think a lot of you know, we just moved in here in Canada um, last June. So it's just like five five months. And we can say, you know, Pam and I on the way on the drive here, we were just talking about that God has really been so gracious that we don't even deserve it. It means nakakahiyana because God has been so gracious in our lives. You see, um, Pam and I have been we're in Singapore for almost twenty years, so that's where we met, that's where we grew up. We went there when we were still single, and that's for so we spent there for twenty years. And then it was actually Jeff and Gemma. They were about to come here. They said, why don't you also apply for Canada? So, sila yung kasalanan. And they gave us this IELTS. I don't know if you know IELTS. These were the first step that you need to do before you can even launch your you know, application. Right? The IELTS. So, Gemma gave us this hard disk, which is full of you know reviewers. And Pam and I, was, when we were saying, okay, simula natin. No? Let's... let's that maybe we can do that. So we reviewed it, took the IELTS, we passed. Okay, my IELTS are tayo. Okay, let's go do the next step. So we created an account and everything, and we go through all the process. And and lo and behold, we were approved. And we were approved. So in 2018, I'm not sure whether I told this story last time when I was here. So in 2018, we actually came here in Toronto just to get our permanent residency. We stayed in Gemma uh, in Jeff's house. We only stayed here for two weeks because, to be honest, we were not yet sure. So we stayed here for two weeks and we went back to Singapore and we prayed for it. We said, "Lord, we do not know whether this is your plan for us." Right? Um, one of the difficult ones because we said, "No, we're okay here in Singapore. You know, we have jobs. The, the kids are doing really well. Um, the kids are citizens, so we don't have a problem. We don't have to move out of Singapore." So we pray. So, Lord. If Canada is really the place for us that you have given us, Lord, I pray that you open doors and close all our doors in Singapore. So that's what God did. He closed all the doors because of COVID. <laughs> so we were there in Singapore. It's stuck there. So so for those of you who were, you know, stuck because of COVID, it's actually because of our fault. We prayed for that. Damay lang kayo. No, I was just kidding. But we thought that that was the answer. So he said, okay, it answered the tayo ni God. God answered our prayers. He closed the borders literally. So we just we had to stay in Singapore. But then again, we continued praying. And last year, towards the end of the year, something happened and which started us to pray again. Lord, okay pa yung PR namin, di pa nag expire Is this really your plan for us to be here in Singapore and Canada? So we did our part. We tried to apply for jobs. You know, to apply for, you know, look for uh, a place where we can work, a place where we can stay. And God opened the doors one by one. Right? God didn't open the doors one by one. And, you know, um, so what happened is that we were able to find a, a job, school for the kids. And, uh, you know, our transition has been really well, you know, really good. He, God has cleared all our paths to, you know, to get ourselves established here in Canada. And we also were praying to be part of a loving church. So we not only do we have one, but we have two part of two community. We have one there in Ottawa, and we have here the PhD in Toronto, right? And yeah, yes, praise God. And we have also a nice place in Ottawa where we are renting. 
And you know what? And in the last few days, we were praying. I said, Lord, baka pwede makakuha na kami ng sarili naming um, bahay. And it seems like God is allowing us to get a place of, uh, of our own. And uh, we just found out just a couple of days ago that looks like we will be able to get our house of our own. Not here in Ottawa, but in... Uh, not here in Toronto, but in Ottawa. Okay, so you're all invited, you know, if, if that... You're all invited there if that uh, becomes successful. And, you know, I'm saying all this to you. I, I don't want to sound boastful, really. But I just want to testify and um, about God's goodness in all of our lives. It's not really us. We don't deserve it. And God provides for all of us. And pinagus sabi nga namin pa, you know, minsan nakakahiya na we don't really deserve all this goodness and all these blessings. But what I love about it is that all these wondrous things that happen to us becomes fond memories. You know, a few years down the road, when we are faced with a difficult situation, we're always going to recall what happened to us in 2022. Or the time that it happened to us in 2018. Or the time when it happened to us a long, long time ago. So all these, you know, if you look at all our lives, if you get a snapshot of everything that's happened in your lives, it's actually adorned with a lot of miracles. By God. You know, and God wants us always to recall all of those. You know, it reminds us about God's promises, right? Let's go back to the hardened heart. When you have a hardened heart, you don't see any of this. No, you don't see any of this. Just like just like the Israelites, they've been 40 years seeing miracles every day. But not even a single one of them occurred in their mind that maybe there's a possibility that God will also do his promise for us in the promised land. Right? And um, so this is exactly the um, definition of a hardened heart. It's a spiritual heart condition that we, we are unable to see and understand and hear and remember. So that's the state of a hardened heart. But what causes this? What causes the hardened heart? Only one. It's basically sin. Right? Um, this is the, how we reach a condition. And um, as you may know, as, you know, sin is the major part of that. It's a major component. And if we keep on doing something or you know, things that are wrong and we don't repent and stop, our hearts will get hard. Kumaga will get callous if we get on committing sin, if we don't surrender them to the Lord. We don't feel bothered anymore um, when we do things wrong in the eyes of the Lord. And they just become like a habit. Parang no big deal. No big deal na. No? That's become... And you've probably heard the concept of the frog in a kettle. I do not know. But in some other parts of the world, frog is actually a delicacy. You know, they eat it. They put it in a pot. But it's very difficult to boil them. Why? Because the moment you put a frog inside the kettle, what will happen? The frog will jump out. Just last week, my, my daughter brought home a frog. At home, and we were so scared because the, the the frog might just jump out of the because we just put it on a, like a sm small container. So we told our daughter, "Can you please get rid of the frog because we're all scared, right?" So that's what frogs do. So in order to cook a frog, what what do they do? They don't put it on a boiling water. They put a kettle with a lukewarm water, so the frog will be there no problem. They'll cover it, and they'll slowly heat up, you know, with the fire. And the frog will not even know that he's being that he is that it is being cooked already. You know, it's just like sin. Sin, in all its deceitfulness, is this way. We do wrong things little by little. You know, one at a time. Gradually, they get hold of us until we don't think about the wrongness of our actions anymore. You know, the Bible is very clear. The wages of sin is death. And, you know, if there is no repentance, our hearts become hardened. Let's look at the story of one of the person in the Bible. Of course, our fav one, of our one of our favorite character in the Bible. You see, David was called the man after God's own heart, right? But there was a time where David's heart was actually hardened and cold, and it was because of sin. It started with just a small sin. 
It was at that time where kings go into wars. It was just the end of winter. It was spring. So people would go into wars. But David was their idol. He stayed in his palace. Right? So he just started in idleness. The sin of idleness turned into impurity. He saw a beautiful lady. No? Um, he saw Bathsheba. So the thoughts of impurity turned into adultery. And then what happened? He tried to cover it up by asking Uriah, the husband, to put, he, he got Uriah pulled out of the war to cover up and sleep with his wife. But it didn't work. What happened? Then he eventually planned out something. He asked Uriah to be sent back to the, to the war, to the front lines, and ask everyone to pull out so that Uriah will just be there. So it's basically premeditated murder. So if you look at it, it just started from idleness. And David's heart becomes hard and hard and cold and until he committed, he actually committed, you know, murder. Do you see what sin can do in our hearts? In, in, in that example from David's story, it can make our hearts insensitive. It can make it dull. It can make indifferent to God. It hardens our heart to a point that we live a life godlessness. Do you still remember the feeling when you first met the Lord? Sarap, no? Parang it's like falling in love for the first time. So you're always in fire, very hungry for, you know, for, uh, for His Word. I've, I've heard people when they, when they met Christ, when they surrendered their lives to Christ, all they do is read the Bible. They, they basically were able to read it just for a few days. No, literally days. You know, and it's like falling in love. And harding, having a hard heart is the opposite. You know, your fellowship with God becomes so dull and dragging, and that is because of a callous heart. With, with David's sin, we all know that he had to experience the consequence of disobedience. We know the consequence, right? And that's, and that's the start of the I mean, no, not so good things that happened to the house of David. Same for the Israelites. What happened to the Israelites? God said, therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. So there goes the mention of heart again. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So that's the decision. God was provoked. And in some translation, it says, it, it, didn't, say, it didn't say provoked. Some, in some translation, it says God was very angry. And not just angry. He was very, very, very angry. You don't want a powerful God to be angry at you, right? But the Israelites, they went astray in their hearts. They tested the Lord so many times, 10 times in the wilderness. And the word known to them, the, God said here, they have not known my ways. Known means knowing in a detailed way. So knowing intimately. The Israelites, although they have experienced the Lord, they were, the Lord has been, God has been with them, but they have not known God in an intimate way. So having a relationship is actually different from having an intimate one. So just like marriage, when you marry your spouse, it's just the start of a relationship, right? But you need to work on it. You need to do something in order to make that relationship intimate, right? So that's the same. And going back to the verse, not yet. So, going back to the verse, because they did not know God, they, it says they, they always, they repeatedly disobeyed the Lord. And God was very angry. It's, it, the, the, the God said, I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. And you know, the, we know the whole story. The whole generation was not allowed to enter the promised land. They wanted 40 more years in the wilderness, and they were unable to reach what was promised to them. Because of simply disobedience and unbelief. It was basically a result of unbelief. So these generation of Israelites were not able to experience, to physically live in the place that God has dedicated for them. A land of flowing of milk and honey. Such a waste. You know, I've been to, I've been to Israel. So I was so blessed to have a job last time where I can travel to Israel because that's where one of our offices are. So I was there literally 10 times and I've seen it. There was one time I was, I was standing on top of a mountain and I was talking to my friend, to my office mates who was bringing me around. And I said, what's, what's that area? Because what I saw is that there was a, it's like a, 
it's like a demarcation line. So in, the, in that line or in that border, you see one place very green and another place very brown and there's nothing in there. It's just like desert. So I said, what is that? Oh, that's the border of Israel, of Israel and the West Bank. So you see the Israel part is very green. You know, it's very fruitful. There's so much vegetation. But if you go to the other side, there's nothing. It's, it's like a wasteland. And I asked them, why is it like that? And then they told me, oh, it's because of the, you know, because of the geography, because the clouds would always stay here. But you know what? When I was just listening to them, I told them it's not, you know, I told my heart, I said, I don't think it's because of geography. It's really because of God. You know, God has blessed this land to be fruitful. It's supposed to be the land of milk and honey. And you know what? All the Israelites missed that because of disobedience. So for the Israelites, the place of rest pertains to a physical place, right? It says there, they shall not enter my rest. So in Israelites, this refers to the promised land, to a physical place, but it, to Canaan. But for us, the place of rest pertains to fellowship with God. And sometimes that is what we miss. You no, know, because of disobedience, we miss having a wonderful and intimate fellowship with God. The fellowship with God is a place where there is peace. A place of rest does not necessarily mean a problem-free life, right? So sometimes we think, oh, it's a um, enter, enter my rest. Oh, once I, once I enter that rest, there's no more problem. No more problem, no more issues, right? But it's actually a place where we get to experience God's presence in our lives. It doesn't mean that there's no problem. But what it says is that, you know, it's a time in everything where just it can be time where it seems to be chaotic, you know, when there's problem all around, but can be called a time of rest because we are rested in God's presence. We can tell them, Lord, I know I have problems, but I just give it all up to you. you know? And you know, in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, that's my favorite. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present our request to God. And what? And the peace of God that transcends all our understanding. This kind of peace where we can't even explain why we have that peace. This peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that is a place of rest. That is the place of rest that is God is talking about here. So, so you see, let's look at the lesson. You know, God has so much promises to you and me. You know, in Jeremiah 29, 11, what did God say? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. But you know what? Sadly, we miss to experience these wonderful plans because of our disobedience, because of our hardened hearts. And, you know, one of the lessons that we can pick out from this, from this passage is that a redeemed person may lose their blessing because of the disobedience. We may all be Christians. No? Your, our salvation is already secured. right? But sometimes, you know, we miss all the blessings because of disobedience. And all these disobedience have consequence eventually. Number two, so second lesson we can get. You know, when it says here, the wrath of God towards his children is no less than his wrath to unbelievers. These people, the Israelites, they're considered children of God. No? But God had to discipline them. And as children, ch God disciplines those He loves. And when I became a father, that's all, everything becomes, becomes very clear to me. Um, that's where I learned you know, the, the, the notion of discipline. For the Bible says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So are you happy of discipline? Huh? Yes. Okay. <laughs> medyo, medyo tentative. You know, one, one of my children, so, so I have four children, you know that. And one of them were interviewed, I think, I can't remember if it's in school or Sunday school. And in school, I think it was in school. And they were asked, okay, what, for you, what is discipline? So they were talking about, you know, being asked about discipline, you have discipline at work. And then one of them, I can't remember, I think it was DJ, my son. 
oh, discipline is when we get to the toilet and daddy and mommy speaks to us about disobedience and consequence. That's what he speaks to us. You know, discipline. God loves us and so he disciplines us. And that's why we should be thankful. He has already forgiven us from our sins, but there's also consequences to our actions. And that's part of discipline. Some of them are minor consequence, says. Some of them are lifelong. So let's not harden our heart. Let's not disobey so that we can, you know, skip all these difficult consequences. Is it clear? Okay, let's, let's proceed. Now let's go to the application. Let me read again. Let's continue in verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. So, you know, this gives us the application. And, you know, I kind of like highlighted the key words here. There are two commands given to us in this part. One, it's an, one is a negative command. One is a positive command. What, what did they say when I say it's a negative command? It says the first negative command orders us not to have an unbelieving heart or a hardened heart. So do not. That's why it's a negative command. Because this leads us to falling away from God. And falling away means departing from Him and live a life of godlessness. That's one of the sin that we're being protected. And, you know, I kind of like would like, to, I'd like to elaborate more on this. What was mentioned here? So there's a lot of questions here. One of the, you know, biggest question is that um, about falling away, is that about losing our salvation? You know, um, it is not. Um, what God had promised us is that you know, we were already redeemed, just like the Israelites. We were redeemed out of Egypt. That, for our application, we've already, we've been saved. You know, we've already been forgiven with our past, present, and, and future sins. And, but their generation was not able to reach the land that God has promised them. In our application, sometimes we miss all these all god's promise god's promises to us because of disobedience but not our salvation in verse 3 it is mentioned in verse 13 it is mentioned that ultimately what causes us to have a hardened heart is actually sin so the scripture says that if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and he will cleanse us from all our unrighteousness however it is the unconfessed sin that has the cumulative and desensitizing effect in our conscience. You know, those things that we don't want to surrender to the Lord. Until we come to a point that we cannot even identify what is right and wrong. It becomes our lifestyle. Our hearts become hardened. So, you know, we need to examine ourselves daily of our unconfessed and unrepented sin. And we need to ask ourselves, are you harboring a sin right now? Is there anything in your heart that is... You know, that it's very difficult for you to surrender to the Lord. Lord, akin na muna to, hindi pa ako ready. You know, I, I, it's very difficult to let go of this, you know, ungodly relationship. Lord, next time na lang. So, you know, we need to examine ourselves. And so, so, so that's the negative, the first negative command. The second positive, which is a positive command is, one way to avoid from drifting away from the Lord is to encourage one another every day. That's what it says there. Exhort one another every day as long as it, as it is called today. Is today called today? Yeah, so we need to exhort one another. So it's literally like saying we need to do it regularly. We need to do it every day. And one way of doing that is being around and having a spiritual family. And I'm, you know, I'm truly blessed to see how God has been blessing relationships at this church in PhD. And, you know, Pam and I are witnesses of God, of how God is, in, is moving in all the lives of the people here. And we praise the Lord for that. Right? So, how many of you are part of a small group, may I ask? Yeah. 
Yan, very good. And so, for those people who are not yet part of a small group, I encourage you to be part of one. You know, that's one of the wonderful things that happened to Pam and I when we became Christians. The first few years, we were just there uh, attending a Sunday service and we would eat, you know, after service. And after that, we will scrum, we will escape. But you know what? When we started being part of a small group, we become a family of believers who encourages us who truly understands what we are going through, who encourages us and pray for us. So it's very difficult. It's very important for us to be part of a small group, okay? no matter what age you are in. The second is that for those who are part of a small group, when will you be leading your own small group? Yan, yan ang tanong. When you, parang may nar- I heard somewhere there. Oh. I don't know who. So when will you be part you know, small group, for me, small group is just like a staging area. It's not an exclusive group. We're not, you're not exposed to be there forever. Walang forever, right? It's a staging group. Eventually, I see all of you being, you know, leading your own small group as well, discipling other people. And, you know, this is an example of my journey. This is my small group, okay? So most of them are in the Philippines. Not now, so in, in different times. So this is in different times. Um, yeah, so, so these are people in, in Singapore. And, um, and, you know, being part, part of a small group, like what I said, and especially leading a small group, it didn't come to me very easy. You know, there was so many, so many years that I kind of like avoided leading. I, I'm safe being part of a small group, you know. Sometimes the small group leader will ask you to lead a prayer. That's fine, you know. Or sometimes answer you some questions. That's fine. I'm safe in there. But I didn't want to be a small group leader. There's so many overheads and I'm in problema, right? And so what I did, I joined a small group where it's safe for me, you know. Safe for me in a way that when we were single, I was, uh, I was in a small group together with Jeff. So we have, uh, our group is called F1s, right? Faithful Ones. It was also because of that time where they had F1 race in Singapore for the first time. So we named our group, we were the F1s, huh? F1s. But after that, we separated in small groups. I joined this group. I said, I'm safe here. You know why? Because all the people here are mostly old people. <laughs> yeah. Sorry sa mga wala naman nating nandito ngayon. No? So, but, and I said, I'm safe here because we have a small, a small group leader is Kuya Ricky Regalado there in the corner. So I said, if Kuya Ricky decides to move out of this small group or move to a different country, I'm safe because I will be the last one to be chosen as the, the small group leader. Kasi marami pang iba eh. So, right? So sabi ko, I'm safe here. So many people here. And... Um, and, and besides, I said, I'm not one of, I'm not that type of leading a small group because I'm shy, actually. I'm an introvert person. I'm not very good in socializing. It's really an effort for me to stand here and to speak to all of you. So I'm, hindi lang halata, but I'm shy. Hindi, totoo, ayaw nila maniwala. So, and I said, you know, it's, and I said, I don't know much about Bible. So if they ask me a very difficult question, how am I going to, you know, supposed to answer them? Hindi naman pwedeng, no, na wala ko masagot. So I was, I was trying to avoid being, you know, part of a small group. And that was just my comfort zone. And, you know, and besides, I said, eventually, if I become a small group, it's going to be difficult because I need to prepare for the topics. I need to, you know, do one, do one with these people. And so I said, I said, I don't want. But God did something. He, one by one, removed these people. So some of them, our D-group leader went to Australia. Some of them went back to the Philippines. Some of them went different places until I'm the last one there. <laughs> so my, my D-group leader told me, Angelo, I'd like to talk to you. Kinabahan na ako. Sabi ko, patay na. Sabi na, I'd like you to, ano, the, actually, he spoke to two of us, so me and another one. I'd like to talk to both of you because we're leaving to go into Australia and we need, a, you know, a small group leader. And I was pointing to the other person. Siya, 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 siya. Sabi, na, sabi nung isa, no, I don't think, I don't think I'm, uh, I'm I, I don't want to lead a small group. So, ako na lang yung natitira. So, eventually, you know, eventually, I became a small group leader by force, you know, by force. Um, 
But you know what? After all those years, I can say that I've never grown so much in my own spiritual life until that time that I started leading a small group. Right? When you lead and you teach, you know, God's word, you're blessed doubly. Right? So, and so the fear of, and so the fear, because I, I didn't like that, I was so afraid. So the fear was replaced with a deep sense of fulfillment. And I guarantee you that not based on my experience, but on the promises of God, that it will be the same for all of you who decide to take the step of faith, leaving, leading your own small group. You know, that's my assurance. So let's obey the command in Hebrew chapter 3, that, that verse there which says, Exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It's very important to be part of a small group. Because what the enemy would do is that he likes to isolate people. You know, when you're just like, just like the, you know, if you look at those African documentary, you know, those lions chasing their prey, they would isolate the weakest one, the, isolate one from the herd. And so it's easy for them to, you know, to, to capture them. And that's what the enemy also wants, us, wants to do with our lives. He wants to isolate us. So by being part of a small group, there's a group of people who will pray for you, who will support for you and and um, will give their life to you as well. So, um, yeah, so let's go to the next application. So it says there, um, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. And none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence to the Lord. You now, going back, just emphasizing on verse 14, we have come to share in Christ. So we have something in common with Christ, and that is Christ's salvation. You now, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned, and we cannot save ourselves. And it was Jesus Christ who came down here on earth to pay for all of our sins, to pay the penalty of our sins. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in us. And if we are truly genuine believers, then we will endure till the end. That's what it says here. We will endure until the end. Our salvation is secure. So, enduring is actually the evidence of our salvation. And it is not something that we need to satisfy in order to be saved. Do you understand? So, it's an, enduring is the evidence of our salvation. It's not something that we need to satisfy in order for us to be saved. And just, just like what I mentioned, one of the most common questions that, we be, that believers ask is that, you know, can we lose our salvation? And the answer is no. no. Once we are saved, we are assured of our salvation. And how can you lose something that you didn't even earn in the first place? Right? If you just come to think of that. In John 20, it says, I give eternal life that they shall never perish. And this is what God promises us. No one can snatch them out of my hand. That's God's promises. And as genuine believers, we have been redeemed by faith. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, we have been redeemed by faith, but can we live in faith? What? So living in faith means living a life trusting the Lord unconditionally. You know, there will be times where we think things does not make sense. But the Proverbs uh, 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So we need to live a life of faith and trust God always. You know, as we continue in verse, um, um, it says here today, if you hear his voice, do not harden his heart. If you come to notice, if you read the passage, this one is repeated again. And this is from Psalm 95. And you know what? In the Bible... When something is repeated in the Bible, we need to pay attention. So God is emphasizing that. 
So today, that means we need to act now. Let's not put it off. Let's not delay. Delayed obedience is disobedience. You know, that's what I always tell my kids. So in the story of the Israelites in Numbers 14, after hearing Moses about God's wrath, so going back to that story, when they were told that you can't, sorry, you cannot enter God's um, promised land anymore, all of the generation. You know what they did? The next morning, they went to the highest point of the hill and shouted that they are ready to enter the promised land. Said, Lord, Lord, we're ready to enter the promised land. You know, but Moses said, it's too late because they've been turned away from God and that he will not be with them and you will fall by the sword. You, he told everyone, all of you will fall by the sword, basically telling them that it's too late. So the lesson for us is that let's not put off disobedience. Let's not obey. Let's obey today. So tomorrow, you know, they, they said tomorrow is the devil's today. The, the devil will always say, just do it tomorrow. But let's not do that. Let's obey today so that we can um, save ourselves from all these, you know, from the, all the consequence. As we close this message, you know, I, I'll read verse, nine, verse 16 to 19. For those, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. You know, as we summarize these passages, I would like to emphasize, you know, verse 19. It says there, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So we see that they, the Israelites, were unable to enter because of unfaithfulness, because of their unbelief. Unbelief means it was impossible for them to enter the promised land because they didn't live in faith. You see, God wants us to experience the life to the fullest. He came so that we may have life and have it to the fullest. And Jesus came for us to save us from our sins and give us salvation. And he wants us to live a life that is rested on him. In Hebrews 11, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe in that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. As I close, you know, in, in 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr., so this is a junior, flew his plane from New York City um, together with, uh, to his family home in Massachusetts for a wedding. On board were his wife, Carolyn, and uh, her sister. So Kennedy was a licensed pilot, pilot, but he has not been approved yet for instrument, um, for instrument flight. That means instrument flight means completely um, depending on instruments, you know, especially when you can, there's no, when there's no much visibility, you rely on your instrument. So John F. Kennedy Jr. was a trained license, but he was not, he does, didn't have experience much on instrument flying. When their, you know, when their plane took off, it was um, delayed until after dark. So they were flying in the dark and Kennedy should have waited for daylight or maybe experience for, um, waited for a more experienced pilot to help. Um, but Kennedy decided to take off into the darkness. The plane never reached its destination. We know what happened there. And all the three passengers were killed in crash. So it, Investigators determined that the crash was likely cause of disorientation. That means the pilot was disoriented that didn't even know where the sky is and where the ground is because they were flying in an open water and even in the night. Kennedy's lack of experience led him, you know, um, may have led him to trust in what he thought he was seeing. So instead of looking at the instrument cluster, he was looking at, the, at what he was seeing. And he, because of this, he was disoriented. Then that, that led um, to their demise. So all of us face the temptation to walk according to sight, you know, instead of faith. And faith in God will keep us from crashing. And human reason will fail us at times, but God never fails us. 
Right? Can you say that? And His Word keeps us on the right course as long as we obey. You know, as we, as we look into our hearts today, some of you may, a believer, may be a believer who has accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. However, you attend church, listen to Sunday message, or even attend small groups merely out of obligation. With all those, you still feel that you may have fallen away from God and that you feel that you have departed from your first love. Today is the time for you to refocus and to rededicate your life to the Lord. Only a life with the Lord can we truly enjoy a life of satisfaction, contentment, a life of joy, and a life of peace that transcends all understanding. So we need to live by faith today. For some of us, you may be someone who are slowly drifting away from the Lord because of sin. You are living in sin, something that perhaps you're not yet ready to surrender to the Lord. And I pray that this message speaks to your heart. It could be a sin of unforgiveness, a sin of addiction, ungodly relationship, or an attitude that is not pleasing to the Lord. And I pray that you heed to God's warning. My prayer is that you hold on to the power of the Holy Spirit and finally surrender that to the Lord today before it's too late. You see, the cost of obedience may be too high. And it seems that you cannot afford to take it out, uh, to, to, to take it for now today. But brothers and sisters, Jesus died for all of us to redeem us from all our sins and give us a life that is to the fullest. Not a life compromised because of sin. God knows your situation. So live by faith today and He will let you experience the amazing life that he had set for you. If you are someone who is also listening now and you have not fully surrendered your life to the Lord, I pray that this message speak to you. God is a God of justice. That's who he is. And he needs to make sure that whatever sin that is done must be paid for. Any injustice must be paid for. But he is also a God of love. He truly loves you and me, and so He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to pay for all of our sins. And that is the only way that we can enjoy eternity with God. God loves you, and He has given you freedom whether or not you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And, but I'm not talking about man-made religion or church membership or, or anything legalistic, but I'm talking about accepting in your heart, Jesus' death and resurrection as payment for your sins and receiving Him as your Lord and Savior. By faith, I pray that you accept Jesus in your life today. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, for making your word clear to all of us. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder. We know, Lord, that you discipline us and you give us reminder because you truly love us. I pray, Lord, for all of us here today, especially those people, Lord, who are some of us who may be experiencing pain, experiencing challenges, and also for some of us, Lord, where our heart may have been hardened over the years of not spending time with you. I pray, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, because your love for us is unconditional. Despite of our unfaithfulness, we understand and we know, Lord, that you are faithful. And your love for us is not like a shifting shadow, and it remains constantly. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you convict, your, convict our hearts. Lord, I pray that you help us to draw strength from you and help us to inch slowly and slowly, Lord, towards you. And we thank you, Lord, because we can just imagine your loving arms receiving in your us in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness in all of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. Thank you, Lord, for giving us hope, giving us joy, and giving us peace. Lord, I pray that help us to always rest, stay in your restful place, that we'll have a, you know, a dwell in your presence the whole of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen and Amen. Let's give a clap or offering to our Lord God.